Good afternoon, everyone. When Jennifer asked the Oakville Museum for someone to come and represent them, she asked for someone, she asked for something that was very, very old to come to the museum. And for some reason, whenever someone comes to the, our museum and asks for something very, very old to come out and speak, I seem to be the one that they send out. However, it makes me a living artifact of some sort, so I think I actually uh, take that in my stride. I, I take that as a compliment. So it's very, very nice to be here today, and this is a lovely spot here at this, uh, this Holiday Inn in Oakville. And what's interesting is that while we're here in the south part of Oakville now, if you went back to the early, early days of Oakville, we wouldn't even be in the town of Oakville itself. We would be in a forested area or maybe a farming area much, much farther to the north. And it's the story of early Oakville that I'd really like to be able to tell you a little bit about, about today. Now, what we do at the museum normally is that we have our museum that's down at 8 Navy Street, right at the bottom of Navy Street, right where the lake is. And of course, people come in and they can visit the area. They can look through the historic home of the Chisholm family and they can have a look and see some of the artifacts and some of the stories that are there. Well, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to actually bring you some, some of the stories out here. What we're going to be doing is bringing along many different generations of the Chisholm family. A clever shipbuilder, a mayor of Oakville, two postmasters, a brilliant inventor, a gallant soldier, a skilled yachtsman, a stylish raconteur, a philanthropist, an historical author, a talented artist, and a dedicated doctor. So, with all of these people visiting, I'm sure you'll learn certainly a thing or two about the Chisholms of early Oakville during your luncheon today. Now, I do have a question for you. How many of you here, you can just raise your hand, how many of you here live in the town of Oakville? How many of you are actually Oakville residents? There's quite a few of you. And how many of you have been to the Oakville Museum at Heracles? All right, I am very, very impressed. Very nice. So I don't have to say anything else tonight. You can just, you can come up and fill in all the blanks with it. Well, it's very nice that we have, and this is, we like to think of ourselves as one of the best kept secrets in Oakville. We have a lot of people who say, I've lived in Oakville for 40 years, and I've never been in your museum. I've never even, never set foot in it before. So we're very pleased when people do come and visit. You'll have an opportunity yourselves to come and visit at any point as well. So when we look at the early days of Oakville, we go back, of course, to the time before it was the town of Oakville. The 19th century had just dawned, and the people who were living here were the Ojibwa hunters-gatherers, the Mississauga, who for generations used the land exactly as it was, and they passed it along pretty well as they had found it. However, when the Europeans came over and started to inhabit this area, the land was being transformed, transformed in a way that the Europeans were certainly similar to back home. However, settlement could not proceed without a formal treaty between the Aboriginal proprietors of the land itself. So, in 1805, the British Crown bought the land in something that is now known as the Mississauga Purchase. All the lands on the north shore of Lake Ontario, from Burlington Bay all the way to Etobicoke Creek, was now crown land and part of the growing province of Upper Canada. All the land, except around the lower portions, around the mouths of the creeks themselves, and here the Mississauga held the land for another 20 years. And these are important years for the development of Oakville. Eventually, these reserved parcels were also ceded to the crown and the Mississauga, they moved out. Their descendants now live at the New Credit Reserve near Hagersville, Ontario. The land here at the mouth of the 16 Mile Creek was now available for sale. And enterprising and skilled businessmen wanted to purchase and develop that land. One of those interested was a clever shipwright and a businessman named William Chisholm. This is an entrance to our museum at Ericlis. Chisholm had a dream. And that dream became the town of Oakville. William Chisholm and his descendants would put their stamp on this area for many decades and make innumerable contributions to our society. 
Well, I can't tell you about every single Chisholm who ever lived in Oakville, and perhaps some of you are actually blood relatives. But I will tell you about some of the more prominent ones. And that, of course, starts with the founder of Oakville, William Chisholm. The Chisholms were, as you can no doubt tell by their name, a Scottish clan. They hailed from northern Scotland up near Inverness. In fact, the family castle was named Erclis. Many years later, the Chisholms of Oakville would name their proud home after that castle. However, times in Scotland were changing, and Chisholms migrated out of Scotland and crossed the ocean over to His Majesty's loyal colonies in the Americas. And it was there, before William Chisholm was born, that his father, George, settled the Chisholm clan. And all went well for the Chisholms, until the Revolution. Thirteen of the British colonies rebelled against the Crown, and the American Revolution had begun. And the Chisholms were caught right in the middle of it. They remained loyal to the British Crown, of course, and they fought against the American rebels. They, and thousands of others, became known as the United Empire Loyalists. When the rebels won, they declared a new republic, the United States of America. The loyalists, of course, refused to stay, and many were brutally driven out. The largest migration in North American history began as thousands left that new republic. The Chisholms headed north into one of the colonies that did remain loyal, Nova Scotia, which in Latin means New Scotland. And it was there in Shelburne, 1788, that William Chisholm was born. However, the family didn't stay there for very long. Within a few years, the clan moved from the forests of Nova Scotia into the forests of Upper Canada and settled in Nelson Township near the north shore of Lake Ontario. Nowadays, it's actually just a little part of the city of Burlington. And make no mistake, it was still, in those days, very much a wilderness. However, the United Empire Loyalists were a hardy group, and they weren't put off by hardships or hard work. They began to populate the province, including the north shore of Lake Ontario. Being loyalists, they were naturally enough wary of the Americans having fought one war against them, and they took steps to protect themselves. One major problem they encountered was the vast forest that ran through the province and made travel very difficult. Even on foot, it was very difficult. In a time of emergency, it was impossible to move quickly. So, the Queen's representative, the Lieutenant Governor, John Grave Simcoe, he took steps to remedy that problem. He had what was termed a military highway hacked out of the woods. Now, it certainly wasn't a highway by today's standards, but it did serve its purpose very well. Troops, supplies, and people could now move with relative ease east and west through the province. The Governor's Road actually started in Montreal and went westward to Kingston in Upper Canada. From there, it headed further west along the north shore of Lake Ontario. And when it reached the western end, it then continued south until it reached the Niagara River. One of the great benefits of the Governor's Road were that villages would spring up in its route. Nelson was one of those villages. North of here, there was a small village called Trafalgar. North of where the Bronte area is, there's a small village called Palermo. And it was in that Nelson area, a little bit further to the west, where William Chisholm grew up. And of course, the Governor's Road is Dundas Highway, Highway Number 5. And despite what the family had lost during the Revolution, and despite the hardships of the Canadian wilderness, the family worked hard and prospered. One of the people that William came into contact with in that area was Joseph Brandt, the great Mohawk military and political leader. Together, they would roam the forest and hunt and fish in this natural paradise. All the while, William saw the potential of these huge forests, especially for shipbuilding. But that would lie in the future. When William turned 24, two major events took place in his life, love and war. On May the 23rd, 1812, William married a woman from good loyalist stock, Rebecca Silverthorne. 26 days later, the United States declared war on Great Britain and invaded Upper Canada. William put all thoughts of love and marriage aside and quickly volunteered to defend the province. He joined a flank company of the 2nd Regiment of Gore, and as a young Canadian volunteer, he proved his worth and eventually rose to the position of colonel, a position that he wore with pride and distinction for the rest of his life. And it was in that service that the young ensign met one of the greatest Canadian 
um, soldiers in Canadian history, the British Major General Isaac Brock. No doubt one of his proudest moments was when they captured Fort Detroit and raised the Union Jack over the fort. However, William Chisholm would suffer a personal loss as well. William's brother-in-law, George King, the man who married William's sister Barbara, was killed during the war. William would be so moved by that loss that one day he would honor his fallen brother-in-law by naming a street after him in the new town. That street in the heart of Old Oakville is King Street, just one block north of the lake. Chisholm would continue in the military for three more years, and with the war over, it was time for peace and for prosperity. The American threat was gone, and except for one brief spot of trouble in 1837, William wouldn't be needed again militarily. However, ever prepared, he did organize and train his own local militia force, just in case. William returned to civilian life and purchased a farm up on the Governor's Road near the town of Nelson. There, he and Rebecca set about expanding and raising the farm and their family. William became a merchant, buying and selling wheat. In 1820, he was elected to the provincial parliament, then called the Legislative Assembly, which would meet in Toronto. He was a member of the Tory party, of course. Within two years, he had established a shipyard in Wellington Square and owned ships of his own, which would sail out of the port. Wellington Square is where Spencer Smith Park is now in the downtown Burlington area. Meanwhile, to the east, the vast forests of white oak and pine trees lay untouched on either side of the 16 Mile Creek. William studied the area to determine what the rate of landfall was from the escarpment as it fell toward the lake. Was the water rate sufficient for the placement of mills? Were the forests capable of supplying enough lumber for possible shipbuilding business in that area? Could the mouth of the creek be dredged deep enough so a shipyard could be built there? These were the great issues that the businessman pondered. Eventually, he decided it was worth the money and the effort, and William Chisholm started off on the greatest adventure of his life. In 1827, he petitioned the government asking permission to purchase land on both sides of the 16 Mile Creek at the mouth of the creek, where it flowed into Lake Ontario. The government granted permission, and at a public auction at the 16 Hollow, William Chisholm purchased 960 acres of that land. He paid just over a thousand pounds, three thousand dollars, and he paid for it out of his own pocket, the only privately financed harbor in all of Upper Canada. The town of Oakville had begun, and there was a lot of work to do. The mouth of the creek was dredged and the shipyard was established on the east side of the creek. A grist mill was built and a new post office was erected. The town was now being formally planned out. And the person that William hired to lay out the town was his brother-in-law, Merrick Thomas. Merrick was married to Rebecca's younger sister, Esther Silverthorne. William would reward Merrick by naming a street after him as well, Thomas Street. By the way, Thomas Street is only a block and a half west of the building that houses Peter Watson Investments. It's a very, very short walk. It goes from Randall Street and you can walk all the way straight down to the lake itself. It is a historic walk indeed. Now it's interesting to note that both of the streets that William named after his brother-in-laws, King Street and Thomas Street, actually intersect at one spot. The two brothers-in-laws that are forever linked on one street in Old Oakville. And this is actually the Merrick Thomas farmhouse itself. If you go where Dorval Drive intersects Lakeshore Road, it was on the northeast corner. It was moved into Lakeside Park later in the 1950s by one of the Chisholms. Now, skilled carpenters who would come to build ships and remain to build houses, and the village of Oakville began to start. Officially, in 1834, it became a port of entry, and William had yet another title to add to his long and his impressive list, that of the collector of the customs. As an official port of entry, ships coming into Oakville could go through customs, and that meant they had to have an actual custom house itself. In 1835, on the land overlooking the Oakville Harbor, a modest brick building was built. That building would eventually become the north section of the Erkless home. 
But then it was the official custom house for Oakville. And that posed a problem for William Chisholm. Simply put, the man was being stretched too far. He couldn't perform all of the duties in both Nelson and in Oakville at the same time. He required another assistant. And so he did what was quite common practice in those days. He appointed one of his sons as his apprentice. Robert Kerr Chisholm, or R.K., as he was known within the family, was William and Rebecca's fourth child, born in 1819. William trained him to become the deputy custom collector and also the deputy postmaster. And this is the old post office. He would be living in Oakville himself on the second floor above the custom house. Thus, young R.K., who was only 16 years old, would be the first of the Chisholms to actually live in Oakville and live in Erklis. I'm sure he didn't know it at the time, but he would end up living there for the next 64 years. Meanwhile, William continued to maintain his various posts, and when the rebellion of 1837 broke out, he responded to the call to arms and became one of the military leaders that put down the Toronto Rebellion. Second Regiment of Gore presented him with an honorary sword for his efforts. That sword is in the library at Erklis. In fact, Chisholm's contribution to fighting the rebels was so considerable, he would eventually petition the government and ask for more time to pay off the loans he, he had taken out to finance the building and the growth of Oakville. Two years later, in 1839, it was finally time for William Chisholm to move into the town he founded. He and Rebecca and the family moved into a wooden house on the southeast corner of Thomas Street and Colburn Street, which is Lakeshore Road. However, their stay there was very short-lived. On January the 17th, at home, which they rented from Merrick Thomas, a wooden house, it caught fire from a defective stovepipe and went up in flames. Fortunately, the family escaped without any harm, but they now needed a place to live. And so, the Chisholm family marched down Navy Street and arrived at the small brick building, the Custom House. That's the first third of the house that you'll see here. William then informed his son that after four years of living on his own, he would now have to share the accommodations with the rest of the family. There is no written record of R.K.'s response. However, the Custom House, Chisholm Home, was now expanded southward on both floors, and the lovely indoor staircase was added. As you can see from here, this is the original section. The second section, 1839, extended here with a porch and then up into the second floor. Later, a separate building was erected across the field to the southeast of the new home, and that building became the new custom house and a local branch of the Bank of Toronto. So finally, we had William Chisholm becoming an Oakville resident. Ironically, Chisholm's time in Oakville would be a very short one. The year before, he had promoted his son, R.K., to deputy collector of the customs, and the property was deeded to him. And while he was still paying off the government loans, William began a new enterprise, the Oakville Hydro Company. To put it mildly, it was not a financial success. William declared bankruptcy in 1842 and died shortly after in Erklis. He was 54 years old. Without him, there would not have been the town of Oakville. He was many things over his lifetime. A proud son of United Empire Loyalists, a gallant soldier, a shrewd businessman, a loving husband and father, a politician, and above all else, he was a visionary. He was a man of his times, a man who lived life to the fullest. And when his days were over, he certainly had something to show the world, the town of Oakville. William Chisholm is buried at the Chisholm family plot at the Oakville Cemetery, which is just a little bit to the west of this property. If you follow it westward to where the 16 Mile Creek is, that is where the, Oak, the old Oakville Cemetery is, and at that time, that was far north of the village itself. It was way out in the outskirts itself. Now, what we're going to do is look at some of the other Chisholms and some of their contributions to the town. Now, they may not have founded Oakville, but they certainly contributed to it. And let's start with William's wife and the mother of 11 children. 
Rebecca Silverthorne. You can see her at the top of the, 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 uh, the screen. The Silverthorns were also proud United Empire Loyalist families. And she was born just north of Lundy's Lane. And when she was 12, the family moved up into the Etobicoke Township. She married William in 1812, and eventually they had 11 children in total. Rebecca's younger sister, Esther, no doubt named after their mother, married Merrick Thomas. And while the Chisholms were still living in Nelson, Esther and Merrick were living in their farmhouse a mile west of the 16 Mile Creek. Rebecca may be best remembered for something that she didn't actually do herself. Her husband named a street after her. Every person who's grown up in Oakville has at one time or another traveled along a part of Rebecca Street. And yes, in case you were wondering, there is a corner of Rebecca and Chisholm Street. After her husband passed away, Rebecca stayed with her son, R.K., for the next 23 years of her life until she passed away in 1865, just two years after Canadian Confederation. As a proud United Empire loyalist, I'm sure she would have enjoyed the fact that they're following British parliamentary traditions. Rebecca is, married, is buried beside her husband in the family plot. Now, when next look, we're going to have a look here at R.K. Chisholm. This is a picture of him over here, a little bit further in life when he had long sideburns. And he's certainly one of the earliest inhabitants of the town of Oakville. When he moved into the second floor lodgings, it, uh, in 1835, the village was in its mere infancy. When he passed away in 1899, we had already been an official town for 42 years. He moved into Erkless two years before Victoria became the Queen of England, and he died two years before the end of her reign. And while everyone acknowledges that William was the founder of Oakville, they'll also recognize that R.K. Chisholm played a large role in the development of the town as well. When he looked around Oakville in his final days in 1899, he must have marveled at this place which not long before had been a pristine virgin forest. When his father died in 1842, R.K. also became responsible for the port and postal operations. By 1857, 30 years after William had bought the, the forest, this village could officially become incorporated into a town. And on May the 27th, 1857, the village of Oakville became the town of Oakville. Oakville gets its name, of course, from William Chisholm's other nickname. Outside of Colonel Chisholm, he was also known as White Oak Chisholm because of the wonderful white oak wood that they would cut down for the timber. They would use it that, that white oak timber for building ships, which was very, very valuable, and also for building homes, but also for barrels. And barrels full of rum could go for quite a price in those days, so that was something that was uh, extremely valuable that they had. R.K.'s older brother, George King Chisholm, became the first mayor of Oakville. And R.K. became one of the town councillors. And the brother-in-law, Peter McDougall, who married Mayor Jane Chisholm, he became a councillor. Show you the influence of the Chisholm family. There were only five members of council in the original Oakville Council. And you can see that three of them were related to the Chisholms. There's no doubt that many of the great political decisions of the day would be made in the library at Erkless while the gentlemen were enjoying after-dinner cigars and brandies. When we get to 1858, R.K., in anticipation of his marriage to Flora Matilda Lewis, completed the second and final addition to Erkless. Incidentally, it was also at the time that they first referred to the place as Erkless. He thought it should have that grand title. And of course, the title goes back to the castle that the Chisholms had in northern Scotland. And in Gaelic, the traditional language of the Scots, Erkless means by the water or a place by the stream. Perfect name for this house as it's right beside the 16 Mile Creek and right beside the waters of Lake Ontario. R.K. and Flora were married that year and eventually they had six children. Flora, known as Tilly, was born and raised in Buffalo, New York. And when she, and she was 19, she was formally engaged to R.K. Chisholm, who was 19 years her senior. It was not unknown in those days. Older men would quite often marry younger ladies. Their fourth son, Alan Stewart Chisholm, remained at Erkless with the family. When R.K. passed away in 1899, 64-year-old Flora became the new owner 
of Erklis. An American now owned the Erklis estate. What William Chisholm, a veteran of the War of 1812, would have thought of that as anyone's guess. But it was something he would probably have to get used to because over the next few years, there would be two different American women who would own Erklis for many decades. The next 19 years, Flora and her son Alan lived, lived there. And then things changed, and very quickly. In 1918, Flora passed away from Spanish influenza, worldwide epidemic, and it left the estate to Alan. Now, Alan, he was the youngest son of R.K. and Flora, and while he never had the great responsibilities that his father and his grandfather had, he kept himself busy as an avid sailor, a horticulturalist, and a horseman. He also took a huge interest in the grounds of Erklis, adding the coach house, the carriage house, the tennis courts, and the ornamental gate, which he hand-built at the north end of the property. Now, the actual story of the building of the coach house is quite an interesting one. Alan had long sought permission to have a coach house built at the north end of the property. However, every time it was turned down by his mother. However, one time when Flora was away on a lengthy vacation, R.K. had the coach house built. His mother was no doubt displeased when she returned, but the coach house, beautiful addition to the grounds, remains to this day, and the town of Oakville is all the richer for it. Allen was a bachelor, and Erklis was the location of many, many lively parties and social occasions. Unfortunately, Allen also passed away from Spanish flu shortly after his mother's death in 1918. The siblings had been, it was left to them, and they had no interest in living there. Instead, they decided to sell, but also to keep it within the family. And that brings us to the other branch of the Chisholm family, and that is the great love story between John Alexander Chisholm Jr. and Amelda Beeler. When you look over on the left-hand side of our chart over here, John Chisholm was R.K.'s older brother, and he was basically a farmer. His son grew up as a farmer, but he also had a knack for inventions. And when he grew up, he ended up inventing a very, very interesting machine that made him one of the wealthiest Chisholms at all. He invented a, a machine and he had it manufactured. It was the first pea-hulling machinery, which was patented first in Germany and then later in the US. The problem of separating the peas from the pods baffled the Chisholms until John had a chance acquaintance with Robert P. Scott, an inventor from Ohio. They got together and came up with a machine that could go through the fields and separate the pea, the actual, the actual big uh, pods themselves, from the vines. Then another machine would crack the pods open and get the little peas out themselves. The Chisholm and Scott pea vinery machine was mass manufactured at Suspension Bridge, New York, very close to Niagara Falls. And while attending, and he was keeping updated with the latest inventions and the different things that was taking place. When we get into the 1890s, he's in Topeka, Kansas at a canning convention. Again, latest up to date, how to keep fruits and vegetables in one, one piece. John Jr., when he was there next door, there were models, modeling clothing. Well, somewhere along the line, the rich Canadian inventor, John, met the beautiful American model called Amelda Beeler, and they fell in love. And she became his future wife. This is Imelda down here, the large picture. The large picture is the note that they live uh, in the Erklis home at one point or another. So they were married, and they ended up living in Oakville, across the street from where Erklis is. At that time, there was a big, beautiful house, and it was called Mount Vernon, named after a place in Scotland. And unfortunately, that home itself burned down in 1928. But in 1902, the happy couple had two daughters, Hazel and Juliet, and the family moved across the lake and lived in Rochester, New York for a time. They built a new home in Washington and planned on summering in Oakville and wintering in Washington. A year later, their Washington house was barely completed when tragedy struck. John died of typhoid fever. Amelda, now with Hazel six and Juliet one, moved to New York. She actually moved to Manhattan and began to live there year round. She would take vacations, they were very rich, they could go wherever they wanted to, and then they would come back and visit Oakville and live and, and during the summers in Mount Vernon. Fifteen years later, when 
Alan Chisholm passes away and Erklis is available for sale, she buys that and sells Mount Vernon and Erklis becomes her summer home. And that was starting in 1919. We currently have part of Erklis set up uh, in, the, uh, in the salon area and that is set up as it would have been during the 1920s during Imelda's time itself. She spent the rest of her life eventually living in Oakville and passed away in 1951. The house and, pa and the property was then passed on to her daughters, Hazel and Juliet. And 48 years after her beloved husband's death, Amelda finally joined him and of course is also buried along with the other Chisholms. Now the two daughters of John and Amelda were not only remarkable women of achievement in their own right, but they also played a large role in the shaping of Oakville and both are worth further mention. Hazel, Elizabeth, you can see here on the, in the left hand side here, she's the one just, this is Hazel and then we have Juliet over here. And Hazel was the eldest daughter and, and while she was back and forth with her mother into the United States, her destiny always seemed to bring her back to Oakville, right back here to her roots. For all of the Oakville Chisholm clan, it was Hazel who seemed to have an understanding of the historical life and struggles that drove the life of her great-grandfather, William Chisholm. She wrote a book called Oakville and the Sixteen, The History of an Ontario Port, the definitive history of early Oakville. It was all first published in 1953 and it's still in publication. But Hazel's excellent work on behalf of the local history didn't stop there. She became a founding member of the Oakville Historical Society and was instrumental in moving the old post office to its present site. Later, the farmhouse, uh, of the, the Thomas farmhouse, which we saw the Merrick Thomas house, it was also moved into the park, and that is still operated by the Oakville Historical Society. And by the way, that private land, the Chisholm land, where Mount Vernon once stood, that was donated to the town of Oakville, so that's why it is a public park called Lakeside Park. And there are still thousands of Oakville residents who visit that annually. We get into the 1970s, Hazel spent her final days in Shelburne, Nova Scotia with her daughter Nancy. It's an appropriate enough place because the lady who had such an avid interest in family history, for it was in Shelburne, Nova Scotia that her great-grandfather, William Chisholm, had been born among the wilderness and the United Empire Loyalists. Now, if contributing to your society was Hazel's watchword, so too it was with her younger sister. Grace Juliet Chisholm, who they just simply called Juliet, was a person of many talents and an amazing lady. She was born in 1902 and like Hazel, spent much of her youth in the U.S. and then she did settle down for a time in Oakville. As a child, she must have shown tremendous artistic abilities for when she became a young woman, she studied fine art in Paris, France at the Ecole de Beaux Arts and then she became an accomplished painter and a illustrator and that remained her hobby for the rest of her life. Incidentally she illustrated Hazel's book on Oakville. She also contributed to significant magazines in France and some of those uh, pieces of art can still be seen at Erklis today. Juliet was married briefly to an American playwright called Robert Turney who had plays produced in Broadway in, in the 1930s uh, uh, and 40s. However they separated she returned to Canada, she went to McGill University at Montreal and became a doctor. Not a nurse, she became a doctor and one of the first women doctors in Oakville. By that time the Second World War was starting, Juliet joined the army and became a captain in the medical corps. After the war she went and fought against the typhoid epidemic in China in 1947 and she has a remarkable life that these people had. Later she became a doctor at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, and the carriage house at the north part of the property, the property that Alan had built, that became her office during that time itself. And Juliet is truly one of the most remarkable people that they had. Eventually all of the land and the buildings went down to this gentleman here, Montgomery Chisholm Hart, and he was an Oakville councillor, and he sold the property in 1966 and moved up to Barrie, Ontario. However, some of the different people who were living there at that time still come back and they come back and visit themselves. Monty passed away in 2004 and Margot in 2011. In her final years, Margot would occasionally travel down from their home in Barrie and visit the old home. 
She was very pleased that the home that she and her husband lived in and that so many generations of Chisholm's had lived in had been preserved and it was there on view for the citizens of Oakville to visit and to enjoy. And I hope that's an opportunity that you'll have as well to come down and visit our museum. So I'd like to, again, I'd like to say thank you very, very much. You've been a great, wonderful audience. Thank you.